All right. Oh, that was a terrible bell. I'm going to try again. Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, Episode 4, Insert Tab A. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mochi. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's game night experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. It's a pleasure to have you take part in the episode and let us know when we aren't making any sound. For those of you listening later, <laughs> remember you can join us every Thursday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. You know, our first try at that, we sounded way better. Always. So first up, we're going to look at some viewer, reader, listener, because we're on multiple media, so I don't know what the fan... Some feedback from you people out there. It's important to us. We're still new at this whole streaming and podcasting thing, as we prove at the beginning of every episode. And we love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we'd like to highlight some of that positive or some of that feedback, positive or negative. Jay Gordon from Twitter at Jay Gordon 4253 tweets Really enjoy the podcast. Just considered listening to all the episodes. Well, Jay, stop considering. Listen. <laughs> That's awesome, Jay. Now's the time to do it, though. We only have three episodes. If you're going to go through the backlog, do it now. Don't wait till we're 50 episodes in. Sean P. Kelly from Gaming and BS, one of my favorite RPG podcasts, shared this on G+. Mo Tuzano plays his share of tabletop games and has now created a website. He supported us, so please check out his show when you have a chance. I'd like to reciprocate that and say check out their show. Another Sean. Well, we can't go wrong there. We're getting crowded. Thanks for the shout out. Joe Quick. Quick. Swick. 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 Joe Swick. Great episode, Mo. Right up my alley as I'm always looking for a good two-player game. More games for two players, he suggests. Boss Monster. Role Player. Quarriers. And Alhambra, a card game. Joe's someone I've known with and interacted a lot with online. I haven't met him in real life. Someday. Sometime. He's someone whose opinion I both respect in regards to board games and craft beers. Uh, out of his four games, he recommends Boss Monster, really neat game, fairly simple. The only thing, I'm not sure how good to play two-player, so I never tried that. Part of the game is trying to get the monsters to go to the right dungeon, and I worry with only two people, you know, there's no real options there. Sounds cool. Now, role-player, fantastic game. It's a board game where you make a D&D &D character. One of these days, Sean's got to try that one. It is really cool. You have to put your stats in order. Very neat game. I can see that playing really well two players. Quarriers, he is not wrong. That is a fantastic two-player game. The only reason it's not on my list is because the Dice Master system came out, which is a collectible version of it, and that is even better than Quarriers. The only problem with it is it's collectible, and we talked a lot about that last episode when we were talking about collectible card games. Uh, Joe did catch me there, though. I totally forgot to put that on my list. I admit I haven't touched my Dice Masters since they probably put out about 82 expansions in a month, and I'm like, I'm done, not keeping up with this. Alhambra the card game, that one I actually disagree on, Joe, sorry. Assuming it's anything like the tile laying game, I hate any two-player game where I have to modify the rules to fit a sec to play two players. And in that game, there's a ghost player, so you deal a hand of cards and you take them out of the game. Not for me, I don't like that. But hey, to each their own, if you like playing it that way, that's awesome for you. Another one, Steve emailed us to say, Hi, I just heard about your podcast and I'm a new subscriber. Thanks for all your hard work on the show and I'm looking forward to more episodes. Well, thanks for the encouragement and for subscribing, Steve. Steve also has asked us a few questions we should be getting to in a later episode. We really appreciate your comments and your suggestions, your feedback, positive or negative. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or Sean at TabletopBellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop, as if I don't know? <laughs> That's true. You did miss Monday. So every week, we like to take a look back at the games we've played, any events we've attended, other cool gaming stuff that's going on. This is a weekly feature over at TabletopBellhop.com, where I post our week in review as part of the What Did You Play Mondays meme. So Monday game night, uh, we only had one player over, Sean, who happens to be in our chat room tonight. Hey, Sean. Uh, we played a game called The Colonists. He, it was just the three of us, 
me, Sean, and my wife. And we had a really good time with this rather heavy game. But it was so good, we had Sean come back later in the week two more times. So, you know what? I'm going to wait and talk about that one next week when I get into this past week's review. And that's mainly because... Last weekend was our launch party, and part of that was a huge gaming extravaganza at the Bellhop's Tabletop, and we both played a lot of games. It was a pretty awesome event. We started the day off with some ramen from this pop-up ramen shop down by the U of W. It's only open noon till 3 on Sunday. It takes over a regular uh, Asian restaurant. Solon, his uh, local gamer, he's the owner. Really cool guy, and he makes a really good bowl of noodles. Can't recommend it enough. No, oh, seriously. I think Windsor is going to be known for ramen and pizza soon. Like, it is fantastic. After our amazing lunch, we came back to my place, and we played a ton of games. When we started off the event, like after the ramen, we had seven of us. So thinking, let's all play something together. That's a good way to start things off. I grabbed seven wonders. Now, I did a bad thing. I did things I tell people not to do on shows like this, where I couldn't remember the rules offhand, so I had to read them out while everyone was sitting watching me read rules. Don't try not to do that. But you know what? At this point, I knew a bunch of people were going to come. I didn't know how many people were going to come. And I didn't prepare any games. Like, I just figured we'd figure it out. Well, except for a couple special ones we'll get to later. But I had a couple special games played out. But the rest of the game night, we were just winging it. We are going to play whatever. So, yeah, yeah, my bad. So that first round was a bit rough with seven players. It's usually, I find, I would consider Seven Wonders a gateway game. And this is a problem that any modern board gamer is going to have over time is there's a bunch of terms and mechanics and parts of the game that to us are self-evident. Like, yeah, of course, you, you know what resource management means. You know what drafting means. I'd sometimes forget that new players don't know these terms. And we had two, I, I would say, brand spanking new players. Erin, our webmaster, came down and brought her husband. And great people. And I was sitting next to Erin's husband, and he had a real hard time with Seven Wonders. Just the concept of gaining resources but not spending them. And I tried to explain it probably two, three different ways, and it just it didn't click, right? So I'm now thinking Seven Wonders maybe not as great a gateway game as I thought. I had played it once before, uh, so and it, it didn't click in until right away, but uh, I definitely had played it before, and, and once I got it, after, after the first, uh, the passive cards, I was I was back into it, and uh, worked out pretty well for me the first time anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that first game, I don't know if people, uh, if you watch the live stream, you know that Sean and I tied. So that was when we claimed that that's why we get to be the hosts on the podcast, obviously, because we win all the games. Of course, that wasn't true for the rest of the night, but it <laughs> started off that way. So yeah, I felt a little bad. So so Jazz had a, had a hard time with it. Um, so he stepped out. He didn't want to play again. He was embarrassed, which I feel bad. Like, really, we're all just playing to have fun. He shouldn't have felt embarrassed, but I maybe I didn't pick the best game for someone brand new to board gaming. So I also got to work on my wording about how to consume the resources. Because in that game, you get the resources on your thing. But saying you get them, you don't actually get them. It's just you have to have them when you want to spend them. So it's, it's, it's something maybe I'll watch a video on someone else teaching it, see if they have better words. Uh, then we played another game of Seven Wonders. So we kind of broke up. My wife took Jazz and uh, Aaron and someone else, I don't remember who offhand, and they went off to play Azul because we had more than seven people then. That left, I think, six of us to play the second round of Seven Wonders, and that one went way better. Everyone got it now. it's it's Once you get the game, it's not hard. It's play a card, pass the rest of your cards, and when you play a card, it does one of three things. They're all pretty simple. So that was pretty cool. Like I, I think Seven Wonders went over pretty well. And, of course, like it wouldn't be a game night here if someone wasn't playing Azul. As more people trickled in, we split into more groups. Through most of the event, we had at least three tables of people playing games. Now, we only had one camera set up on the main table, so that kind of sucked for people watching, but it would have been nice to have three cameras, but we had enough technical difficulties just trying to set up the one camera, so i kind of glad we didn't try to manage three cameras at once. Sean could probably tell you more about our technical difficulties because it was a lot of fun that day. We so, were explicit that day. So while we do have a, a bit of difficulty getting our audio started at the beginning of these shows on Thursdays, 
Uh, what we don't have a problem with is bandwidth, because I actually have a, a half-decent connection uh, for uploading to the stream. What we don't have at the Bellhop's house is a great connection for the stream. And what we learned yeah. is Discord, where we're getting our video from, does a whole lot of magic when it comes to compression. So we can get our video out of the tabletop bellhop's house and to my house for streaming quite efficiently. What we can't do is upload a stream. Uh, so despite yeah. following all sorts of instructions and suggestions for downgrading our stream, it really never hit a great quality for uh, for creating so we won't be creating a youtube version of that stream it will live and die out on twitch uh, after 14 days yeah if anyone wants to check it out like sean said it, it's pretty bad but you do get to see us playing most of these games actually the games i'm talking about me and sean playing you'll see i'm going to mention the other games people played off camera as well but like the one i'm really talking about you can watch us play those and sometimes with sound sometimes without and sometimes looking like we're on a c64 because of the frame rate it's it wasn't good we were really hoping we were going to get to like pull out sections and go hey watch us play this game and hey watch us play that game but oh well that didn't work out Maybe by next year, MNSI, if you're listening, get fiber to my house. I will pay for it. Please. So after, uh, what did we play last? So after Seven Wonders, we yes. moved on. Uh, over on a side table, there was uh, a local couple who had grabbed the bottom of the ninth off my shelf to try that out. That's a really neat two-player only game where you just play the last inning of a baseball game. Very cool. Uh, one of the best things in that game is it looks like all the cards look like baseball cards and the score tracker looks like a stick of gum. Very cute thematic game. While that was going on, I taught a game of Between the Two Cities. That's a really cool game. We played with six people and it's a drafting game again. So I don't know. It seemed to be the theme of the beginning of the night where you're drafting tiles and you're building cities. But the neat part it's just called Between Two Cities because you're an architect and you're working on a city this way and you're working on a city that way. And you're working with the players on either side. So there's a city between each player. And then the brilliant part is only your worst city at the end of the game scores. So you got to be careful not to give too good a city on one side and not abandon a city on the other side. It's a, it's a really neat game. It was very popular. That was one where we finished playing. Immediately, people are like, all right, let's play again. I get it, because the scoring is a little wonky. So the first time you play, you're just kind of doing your thing, and then you're like, oh, okay, yeah, i got to make sure I want factories, or I want these together, or I want to get four different types of pubs, not one type. I think that one went over way better than Seven Wonders, actually. Uh, it was, you know, it's a fun game. Uh, it was really easy to get in and start playing. I don't think anyone really had any problems with that. Uh, what yep. I realized after after the first play was... I just was focusing so much on my cities, I, I wasn't taking enough strategy into it, and I wasn't looking farther enough afield to take right. down the other folks uh, around me. So I was I was way too focused on my own on my own cities at the time. But now that I've got a couple of rounds under my belt, uh, I feel like uh, that'll be a great game to pick up, and it doesn't take long to play. No, it's nice. It, it it's got a lot of depth for a filler game for something quick. Yeah, absolutely. Now, talking about filler games, this is one that's way simpler, way faster, and way more silly. It's a game called Rumble in the Dungeon. You literally sit there, build a five-room dungeon, you put five different fantasy archetypes in it, and oh, sorry, nine, and a cheese. And then they battle it out. And the goal is to be the last creature, person, character, last character standing, or escape the dungeon with the treasure. It is extremely simple. Every turn, you either move guys, or if there are multiple dudes in a room, you battle. And by battling, you just kill one and remove it from the game. And then once you figure out who won, who's the last person standing, you do scoring. The person, last person standing is 10. The second last person standing is 9. The third last person is 8 going down. Now, the brilliant part in this one is at the beginning of the game, you hand out these tokens and you get two of them with six players and you look and see and you find out which characters you are so no one knows who's who and that's the really like i said killer killer app part of that game was is the fact you have no clue who's who the funny part is uh sean hamilton who's in our chat right now just like did amazingly well 
And I'm not sure if it was his gameplay or luck, but oh my, every round he was like the last one standing every time. It was impressive. Yeah, no, that's so at this point, everything we played. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's a it's a fun little game. It's frivolous and because of the the deck layout, it's it's a little bit different every time as well. I, even as ignoring the the character creation, laying out the table, you got a different game every time as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a fun filler. There's actually, if if you don't dig fantasy dungeons, like who doesn't? But they also have a version called Rumble in the House, where you've got I don't know a bunch of normal looking people as opposed to you know a cheese and a zombie. So that was enough. At that point, I'd had enough light games. Like I like games are fun. You got seven people. That's about all you're going to play with seven people. I like heavier stuff. So at this point, I looked around and I grabbed Wasteland Express Delivery Service. I really dig Wasteland Express. I well, I only played it once, but I really like it even more. But I made a mistake grabbing this one. It's kind of the same mistake I made with Seven Wonders. This one... I learned very quickly it's not a game for people without a lot of hobby game XP. Like, not as bad as no hobby XP. Like, everyone at the table at this point has played quite a few games, but not thousands of games. You know, it was a, it was a fun game. Uh, I don't uh, regret playing it. Uh, I regret some of the, diso- the choices I made early on. Uh, there were some aspects of the game I didn't quite grok... Uh, when I made that initial card pull, uh, and that yeah. that hurt me from that point on. Uh, I, I think well, early on in that game, I became a spectator to what everyone else was doing on their way to winning, um, and I think uh, that was Joyce. But man, we talked about this before uh, last week, I guess, but it is a beautiful game. It is oh, so yeah. well put together. It is, I you know what? I don't know what they I don't know what they charged for. I know it was a pricier game, but it is worth it. It's you know, it's beautiful and everything about it makes it seem really high end. You're not they're not there's no skimping on that game. Yeah, it's very cool. One of the problems with the game is there's so many moving parts. Like if you played a pick up and deliver game like Merchants and Marauders or even uh, Black Fleet, you're like, oh, okay. You played a quest game where you get different quest cards and go to spots on the maps to do actions. Okay, that's cool. You play an economic game where you're having to deal with the market prices varying and supply and demand. Okay, that's cool. Well, the thing is, all of this is in Wasteland. So you have to worry about all those things. And with all that, there were a lot of little fiddly rules. So that's, that's what happened to Sean when he was talking about the card draw. It says, go make a delivery on the card well when you're trying to complete a quest you go there and you have to take an outpost action and the place you're delivering to doesn't need to want the goods and even if they do you only get the reward on the card whereas if you want to make a delivery you have to go to the town that wants the right thing and you take a delivery action so it's it's a fiddly bit and actually it's something the first time we played we messed that up and there's multiple FAQs out there that all talk about these specific cards. Now, I did explain it when we started playing, but like for a new player, that's a lot to soak in at once. And it's one of those little rules you forget. So Sean planned his whole strategy on making these three deliveries, but they weren't deliveries, they were quest actions. And he can only do two outpost actions a turn. Well, whatever, you get it. It's even just trying to talk about it, you can tell it's fiddly. There's lots of little bits going on. I, I would definitely play it again, though, and uh, I think it's the theme is strong. It's it's got a lot. It's got a lot of moving parts, but it's a game, at least for me, where I want to try and and get a hold of those moving parts and and see if I can't uh, do better next time. Do better. Yeah. So while we were playing Wasteland, a gamer I only met a couple weeks ago at the local game store. He's someone who's been coming out with the local events. Uh, shout out to CG Realms and Brimstone Games for hosting local events here. We get together almost every Saturday in game. So I met this, this cool guy, Chad. I don't really know him well enough. I don't know if he wants his last name out there, but he's into heavier games. Like uh, when I, when he's usually there, he's playing Mombasa or he's been playing Gaia Project, which I have to play it with him sometime soon. Uh, so I invited him over because we had a great time playing. Um, we were talking about a couple weeks ago, Bruges and then Haunts of Teutonica. Uh, so I invited him or he showed up and which was an awesome thing because now I had someone else here who could teach games, which is great. 
So having another game teacher in the house let me kind of focus on what we were doing. So he ended up grabbing Bora Bora, grabbed a group of players to play that while we were playing Wasteland Express. As far as I could tell, that went over really well, except with Eugene, because the theme of that is just not Eugene. Eugene should have played Wasteland Express. Somewhere in that time, uh, our friend Dave came downstairs and grabbed Terraforming Mars, and then the longest game ever of Terraforming Mars started upstairs. It was getting a little late at that point, so we did the pizza thing. That's the Windsor-style pizza thing. Sorry, New York, Chicago, you all have fantastic pizza in your own, but it's not Windsor pizza. Windsor pizza is special. I don't think we need to spend this broadcast discussing it, but it'll come up again and again. Windsor pizza is amazing. And Windsor ramen seems like it may be just as good. So after this, uh, it was time for... Uh... The big game of the night, uh, the one we announced we were going to play in live stream. Sorry, again, it didn't quite work out. Big Trouble in Little China. Our group was meant to be Sean, myself, my wife, and our friend Eugene, who I'd mentioned a minute ago. But D was still upstairs playing the longest game of Terraforming Mars ever. So my friend Mike joined in. So it was. it, it is a cool-looking game. I got to admit, like just putting it on the table, the map of Chinatown's really cool. It's bright. Uh, the miniatures are fantastic. They've got different size cards, like the quest cards are nice and big and easy to read. And then the little upgrade cards that don't have a lot of information are little hobbit size cards, which usually I don't like that, but it worked well for that game. Your character ability, which is important, was mid size. So they, they did some good stuff with the look of the game. It's interesting. They use a dice mechanic. Uh, a dice in, in where you place dice, you roll your dice, and then you place them in a card for your action types. And I think they could have made that clearer. They had space on the cards yes. where they could have allowed someone to do things better. And, and I, I think we may have actually even made some mistakes in there at some point along the way, just because it wasn't the clearest mechanic. But I think uh, overall, it's fun. And again, it is a, it's another beautiful looking game. It looks great on the table. The miniatures, uh, even unpainted, look spectacular. You can recognize every character from the movie at a glance. I mean, there's no mistaking yep. anyone, bad guys or good guys. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, that dice system was weird because you roll the dice and the symbols on the dice don't match the actions you take. So all that really matters is where you slot them on your like character card. And then all that actually matters is if it has a if it's highlighted, and that just lets you do a bonus action. Like Eugene in particular had a real hard time. He kept thinking that his body dice were for fighting, and his mind dice were for doing quests, and his soul dice were for moving. I think is what he had stuck in his head. Like every round, I'm like, no, 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 you can do it this way. So that's the one good thing is it is a co-op game. So we were able to talk about it. Like it's not like we you just cheating or anything, right? Like we were able to go, no, 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 put your dice there, put it there. So that's one of the things I could see a pro being a problem in this game is the whole alpha gamer thing. It wasn't a problem in our game. We all got along pretty well, but if someone knows the game, I could totally see them going, no, no, put that there. No, you put that there. Now you move over here. I could see it being a problem. It wasn't in our game. The one thing that did happen is, man, we did brutal, like, like terrible. Like the first half of the board, the whole point, and when you're in Chinatown, is to level up. You're you're getting ready for the boss fight. And the way you're supposed to do this is by beating up some enemy, enemy enemies. We're fighting underwater now. Fighting some enemies and doing quests. Well, I think all we did was fight enemies. We we put ourselves in a very bad position myself primarily on the map. <laughs> yes. And so as the enemies spawned, they all spawned around me and I couldn't even get to a mission without taking all the damage from all the enemies surrounding me and we got a little confused as to you know should they come back me up or should they just let me die and deal with the missions uh dealing with the the, the bad guys on the map is definitely something you just want to run away from and go do the missions yes. and and in hindsight thinking about the movie that really makes sense um yeah Jack isn't going to go there and fight the guys. He's going to pull the gun, realize there's too many guys uh, in front of him, and run away. And had we thought about that and not wanted to be the big role-playing uh, fighters, <laughs> we would have done the same thing and ended up much better. 
That being said, even though we got utterly slaughtered in the first round, when the second round came, we didn't do as badly as we could have, and yeah. it was still fun. Yeah, I gotta agree. I'll admit my friend Mike, would no, he didn't want anything of it, but Mike likes to win. He's all about the win, and whereas I didn't know this, I don't even know if Sean has heard this yet, so I guess when the game ended, Huge went upstairs, and he goes to Deanna, and he's like, it was awesome! We got our asses kicked it was fabulous so he was really into it i do want to play again i i think we would play very differently than we oh, played yes. the first time um it, it is a very different system i expected a lot more from the book like the the read from the book choose your own adventure like we read very little and i don't think that was only based on how poorly we did i think there just is a little less adventure game quest game than i thought was in there I, but I we'll think, see next time. I think a lot of that had to do with the, the lack of missions. We we yeah. barely touched the missions. I mean, the, the the negatives that we had to take on because of, in the second round, because of what we hadn't done in the first round, uh, yeah. seemed to go on for a lot longer than planned. Yes, that's true. Like just to show how bad we did, one of the, the, the thematic things in the game is when you die, you go to one of the Chinese hells, because China has a lot of Chinese... The Chinese have a lot of hells, is the actual quote. I had six hells by the end of the game because my character had died six times. So, yeah, it was bad. So, when we started Big Trouble, at that point, things were wrapping up. Most people stopped by what we played, said goodnight, headed home. And once we finished up Big Trouble, Mike said goodbye, Eugene said goodbye, and it was just the two of us downstairs. And while upstairs was the longest game of Terraforming Mars ever, still going. So we had planned to play Catan Chocolate Edition because it, it had to be done. But we had to wait because the longest game of Terraforming Mars ever was still going on. So we hung out for a bit, Sean and I, we were chatting. And then I clicked in. I'm like, wait a minute. Didn't we just do a podcast episode about two-player games? I totally should be grabbing a two-player game right now. So I did. So we grabbed uh, the Duke and Warhammer Shade Spire two of my favorite well actually warhammer i wouldn't call one of my favorites but i wanted sean to see it the duke is one of my favorite games it's very chess like so it's two players small grid i think it's six by six you put out your duke you put out two other dudes and you're moving on the map trying to capture the other guys guys uh duke and the neat part on this is you don't have to memorize any moves they're on the tiles and when you move you flip over the tile and the moves on the tile change i think that's really cool you know what? I was I had no idea what I was getting into when you brought it out. Um, and I didn't read the cards and, and moves options. So literally every mo every move I was reaching into that bag and I had no idea what was coming out. It was a complete surprise. That being yeah. said, because it was on the it's all on there, it didn't matter. I just had to look at the card, understand what the little dots meant, and mm -hmm. the rest is chess. Uh, and in some ways, yeah. it was a great first experience for the game because I didn't have to know anything. I just took in the whole chess experience with these random, essentially for me, moves that were coming out. But then you add a whole other layer. Once you learn what the possible tiles are, you get yeah. that depth as well. And then we didn't even start to get into the expansions. So I can oh, yeah. really <laughs> imagine that game being completely addictive yeah it's a very neat game like deanna and i played that like crazy for a long time until patchwork came out and then now azul has pretty much re replaced it we still play the duke now and then but like for good two three years the duke came with us everywhere yep. now shade spire second time playing shade spire i still dig it what i really liked in this is the same thing i liked in the last game we set the game up we're playing it looks like one side's dominating like completely dominating and there was a chance for the other side to take it in the last round i think that is really cool the fact that even though you only play three rounds that third round there was still a chance for the underdog to still win the game and it felt thematic it wasn't like a cheap win like there's no real catch-up mechanic it just the way the quest cards come out played out really well and sean was playing i was playing the core knight guys he was playing the sigmar guys and he had that chance that in that last round if the dice had fallen right he would have won which i thought was really neat yeah if the one theme that that plagued us throughout the entire night 
There wasn't a person oh, who sat at the main table <laughs> who could roll to save their lives, literally. It's true. <laughs> uh, and I think it was most shown on Shade Spire when we were trying to roll initiative again yes. and again and again. But that being yeah, I've said, never seen so many ties. I, I love the flexibility of Shade Spire. You've got only got two boards, but they're double sided. You can lay them out any way. The miniatures, again, like we talked about last week, are gorgeous. And as oh, long yeah. as you ignore the fact that they've ruined the the Warhammer backstory, <laughs> the yeah. game itself is fun, and and you really do have the ability to even if you horribly messed up, come from behind and take it as long as you can maneuver yourself correctly and get the right rolls. Uh, it's not always it? going to happen, but again, it's a deck builder, a pregame deck builder. So if you've built your deck right, you get that <laughs> extra chance as well. I see Sean's learning about the deck builder problem now because it's pre-game come up a couple in-game. times on the podcast. I, I think I think we've got pregame deck builder, in-game deck builder. I think there that's, you go. That works. I think that pre-game, works pre-building, deck pre-building. Yeah, just Sounds pre-game, good. pre-game deck build, in-game deck build. That works. So the longest game of Terraforming Mars finally ended. At that point, pretty much everyone else had it out. There were two people that actually were upstairs. I didn't even realize they were still there that were watching the Terraforming Mars game. Or from what I understand, talking during the Terraforming Mars game, which is the main reason it became the longest Terraforming Mars game ever. Fair enough. It's a party, right? It's not all about the games. It's also about the people. So once pretty much everyone headed home, it was just Deanna, Aaron, Sean, and I. So we had pretty much everyone responsible for tabletop bellhop there, right? Like these, these are the behind the scenes. You see me and Sean's face all the time. You know, Aaron's our webmaster. Deanna's my editor. She's also our uh, chat moderator. Plus she's moral support in the background here. Well, Aaron, I don't know if you caught it, but our first ever episode was on Settlers of Catan. And the question we answered actually came from Aaron. And like, that wasn't just a, Hey, I'm your webmaster. I need to give you a question. It was an honest question she had asked because she's not a board gamer. She plays video games. She's a geek. She's into cosplay, lots of other cool stuff, but she hasn't really dipped into hobby board gaming. And she's been really curious about this Catan game everyone's talking about. So it just had to be right to play Catan, but I had to make it interesting because there is a Catan chocolate edition. Like that, it's a real thing. I bought it, it was in my fridge for a week, and we played it. What was cool is it was surprisingly Catan-like, uh, which Sean could attest to, since what we played after is the full game of Catan. Like, you started with settlements and roads, and you there was a spinner, but the spinner generated resources, and the resources were the tiniest cards I've ever seen. Like, they're like dollhouse-sized cards. They were insane. I've got to, if you follow my Twitter, you've seen the picture with me holding them. I felt like a giant. But the actual things you build were literally the exact same card combos you used in Catan. So a road was a uh, wood and a brick, and a settlement was a wood, a brick, a sheep, and an, uh, I'm missing one. Or, Terrible. Or. No, wheat. wheat. There's no ore required for a settlement. But a wheat. Cities were two wheat and three ore. And the only change was that you couldn't buy development cards. Instead, you bought soldiers. The one neat rule is every soldier had to be placed in a city or a city or a settlement. So you can only collect so many of those. And those let you steal cards, kind of like the robber. And what happened was you played till five points. So you start with two settlements. So you had two already. You're trying to build more settlements. Those uh, knights were worth half a point each. Cities were worth two points, and the first person to five won. And you, you just didn't have the hex board. You still spun. You still raised to five points. And then when you win, you get to eat all your stuff you got because your settlements are chocolates, your roads are chocolate, and your nights are chocolates. It, it was fun. And as Aaron described it, I thought this was an apt description. She called it Christmas chocolate because it tasted basically like what you get in an advent calendar. You know what? The only real difference I saw was... You didn't have the interaction of players in the same way because you don't have that hex map. You're not blocking yeah. and, and you're not working on the actual layout strategy. Correct. Uh, so it was missing that. But aside yeah. from that, it was Catan. Yeah, I, I, I'm surprised. I'm pretty sure in my Catan episode, I listed it into the games just called Catan that aren't Catan. No, it actually belongs up in the games that are still Catan. Except it's a legacy game. Well, yes. Before uh, no one realized that um, 
the Catan company made the first legacy game. It wasn't Risk. It was Chocolate Catan. Speaking of Catan, our next game was the full game. My version, Settlers of Catan, or the modern version, Catan, Trade, Settle, whatever they call it now. So I broke up my version. Uh, we set it up. We played the most cutthroat game of Catan I think I've played in my life. And I played a lot of Catan. Like, we used to play every Saturday at my parents' house when they used to go down to Texas. And we play four or five t- games a night, if not more. I have never played a game as cutthroat as this. Like, you know, when you build, I don't know how well you people know Catan, but you have a hex you can build on. And your settlements have to be two apart. Well, everyone made sure to put their settlements three apart so that only two could be on each hex. And when they set up their starting roads, they made sure to point them at each other. And all the sheep was at the bottom of the map, so everyone cut off that area so no one could get sheep. Thankfully, I was down at the bottom, and I was able to get some sheep. And it, it was evil. Like, it, it was a nasty game of Catan. Like, the robber was moving every turn. We were messing with, with each other current constantly. Sean did the Monopoly thing. I'm sure everyone knows what the Monopoly thing is. It, it was good. And what was even better was Aaron had never played before, and she was blown away. Like She's like, this is the best game I've ever played. Actually, I don't know. That game of Terraforming Mars, she was pretty happy about that, too. So between the two, they were both up there. And Aaron won. So I, 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 I don't think it was beginner's luck. I just think she was better at screwing us over than we were at screwing each other over. That, uh, I'm not sure if that one gets dinged out. I'm not sure if that's rated G or not. That uh, that one ploy of getting the you know monopoly in in wheat with a two for anything wheat uh, port just gave yes. her domination yes. in the end. Uh, oh yeah, I couldn't yeah. even I couldn't even keep up. I had well, I heard I fought out the longest road for a long time, but I just couldn't keep up with her resource in, in, income. Yeah, I was the one that stole longest road. She didn't even need it. I got that from you, and I came close. And I actually, the way we played it, we made a slight mistake. Well, not a slight mistake. She didn't realize how the cards worked. I declared that I won. And she's like, oh, if you have those cards in your hand, victory point cards. She's like, you declare that right away, and you win. She's like, oh, so I should have won two turns ago. We're like, oh, okay. All right, here I thought I was doing good. But hey, it, it was fun. Like, it was, it, I, you know, everyone rags on Catan about it being old and dated and why do you play it? It's still fun. Like I play a lot of new modern games. I had a ton of fun playing Catan. There is nothing wrong with that game. Now I I, I would question some of the people who play it competitively, maybe, but as a fun game, yeah. it's a fun game. There are people who play Monopoly competitively. So who am I to judge? So thanks everyone who came out to the event, who was there, anyone who watched live and interacted. We did have quite a few people jump into the chat room for a bit, so I think some jumped in and we were silent or barely moving and jumped back out. Like I think Twitch said our max viewership was nine at one point. I never noticed when there was that many people, but I know um, BP Kurtz jumped in. That was awesome. Chris from Misdirect and Mark was there. A few of the local gamers, Ross stopped in. My cousin stopped in for a little while. So that was pretty cool. Thanks to anyone who came. And if I missed your name, I'm sorry. I didn't make a list ahead of time. I probably should have. It was great to see everyone. Uh, but we still weren't done. Even though oh, even though, no, even though the no. party was over, there so, was still another surprise coming from games. Yes, there had to be. There had to be something. Did did you miss a game that we didn't play at the end of the night? Well, well it, it did get mentioned once already. It was played off to the side. We just hadn't played it. That's true. So I couldn't let Sean go back to Hamilton without playing Azul. So I basically kidnapped him. We went out for breakfast, and then I drove to another city to a coffee shop that has really good coffee and made Sean play Azul. So we had to do it. Uh, we played two games. Deanna was with us. We played three-player, and I think he liked it as much as everyone who I've ever taught that game to. I don't think I've taught that game to someone, and they went, eh, you know, it's okay. Yeah, It, it just doesn't happen. It didn't take a lot of arm twisting to get me out there. One, it was a coffee shop, and two, I saw what you grabbed What you grabbed when we were leaving the house. So <laughs> oh, yeah. it, wasn't a, it wasn't a huge surprise, and no, it's great. Um, it's on my list now, and I, th- I think I want to teach the kids that game because... There's oh, yeah. absolutely no reason they can't play it. Um, and I just have to not be cutthroat when I play it with them and help them do the scoring. Uh, but it's a great, easy game, and it really plays easily, quickly, and it's simple to pick up. Nice. 
Well, we record the show live Thursday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our monitor, and she Games. Now, I see a lot of people here in our chat room today, and we've had a lot of discussion going it's awesome. on. Thanks, everyone, for coming in, and uh, thanks to the folks who are in there and just watching, even if you're not uh, jumping in the chat. I know we've got uh, some familiar people who are taking up a lot of the space, but <laughs> uh, we appreciate it. Uh, I know, what did we see? We've got the uh, version of, the house version of Rumble, the Rumble in the house. Doesn't have treasure. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't have treasure oh, in it. Um, that's interesting. I, th I actually thought they were both the exact same game with a different theme. No, so That seems little, less cool. There's well, a little besides, difference in it. Yeah, it doesn't uh, seem as interesting, besides just not being fantasy. Though I guess, what would you steal from the house, like, thematically? <laughs> um Looks like uh, looks like Grubnats has been uh, playing with the wrong folks. As all his games are that vicious, or maybe it's the right folks. Uh, yeah, it, it goes either way. Like I played Catan with uh, Eugene's friends, the the Chopes and Ernie and them, and uh, they they've added war rules to Catan. So there are some people that definitely prefer their games cutthroat. Yeah, they well, they can definitely be vicious, uh, and we we proved that for sure on. Uh... Saturday night, Sunday morning, early Sunday morning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I did see one note from uh, Brian. It said, uh, both this game and the one Sean talked about earlier, he jumped in when we were talking about uh, blah, 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 between two cities. He said, I hear the idea of I grok, or Wasteland Express. I grok something after playing it that I didn't get the first time, and now I want to play it better next time. You know, so that's a very interesting thing. The fact that a strategy you didn't get the first time makes a person really want to play it again, even though you might have got crushed, which I find is a really good point. And I guess that's a sign of a good game, right? Like when you're like, wow, I watched that. I'd do better next time. Yeah, and that's and I and I get all people aren't like that. There are some people uh, we we mentioned Mike earlier. You know, they they want to be successful, yeah. and and I and I do see the point of that. There's certainly a uh, a benefit in the first time you play a game winning it and getting that rush so that you want to play it again uh, yeah. for me and, and especially with wasteland you know there's a real challenge there's so many parts i didn't expect to you know come out victorious that first game because there were a lot of moving parts and i was playing with two people who'd played before but uh you know seeing seeing the depth of that game just makes me want to try and find some more areas to to play with and and Ways, ways around that game's mechanics because there are so many to enjoy. You can find us on all the major podcast platforms and an uncut video version on YouTube. If there's a way you prefer to listen to podcasts and you don't find us on it, give us a shout and we're going to see what we can do for you. If seeing us live on Twitch isn't enough, you can find both Sean and I live and in person at Queen City Conquest in September. This is a smaller local con hosted at the Buffalo Niagara Convention Center in Buffalo, New York. So be our first official con appearance, though we're just attending the con. We're not special guests or anything like that. Each episode, we look to answer one of your one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to tabletop. Hey, you, you have an outtake. <laughs> you can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or you can head over to the webpage and click on Ask the Bellhop. Well, there are a variety of ways to get in touch. We need your questions. We're here to help, but don't know what kind of help you need. Are you looking for how to transport your games? What's the best snack to bring to game night? Are there good two-player only kid games? Ask away. Well, this week, Jaden asks... Are custom inserts worth it? For instance, my group has been playing a fair bit of Rising Sun with all the goodies, like four boxes worth of unpacking, and it takes about 10 minutes to set up and nearly 20 or 30 minutes to put away properly. I'm wondering if inserts can help with the cleanup. Oh, when I first heard about box inserts, like everyone's been kind of doing their own thing for a while, but like these high end pay lots of money, like sometimes more than the game costs. I was skeptical. I'm like, like, wouldn't you be better spending that $40, $50, $60 on another game? Well, then one year for Christmas, Deanna bought me a bunch of them. See, I'm notoriously hard to buy for. She knows better than to buy me games. I buy enough games in the year that 
she'll like don't even bother trying i'll take care of the games but something like this something to improve the games i have that is a fantastic gift very thoughtful something i actually really appreciated well i got those first set of inserts it was three or four of them i don't even remember specifically which games they were for but i fell in love with them like i i like after that christmas i went online and bought like eight more for like my eight favorite games the thing is though these are luxury items like we we what we're talking about right now is a luxury hobby. No one needs to play board games. It's all just like you don't need to play board games. And even more so, you don't need an insert for your board game. It's never necessary. You it, There's not a game you can't play without one. So their worth is a little hard to determine. And every time I think about this, I get flashbacks to my last job. And I think about risk analysis, where you look at your value-added tasks and your non-value-added. And basically, you kind of have to do the math in your head to figure out if there's enough value added to the game to justify the cost of the insert. Now, I'm going to talk about a few things to try to help you make that decision a little better than just going, man, inserts are expensive or hell, buy every single one. So the one thing inserts do, like the only thing they really do is help you organize the game components. They give you a place to put things, hopefully all the things. Even better, all the things from all the expansions. Thou, that's the, the best inserts do all of that. Now, that one thing, which is only organizing all your things, should lead to two to three positive effects. The first is improved storage. So all your stuff should be more compact. It probably all fits in one box now. If it does fit in one box, it's taking up less room in that box. It should be easier to transport. So instead of having to bring, what Jaden say, five boxes for Rising Sun to the game store, or he can bring one game. It takes less room on your shelf. If anyone saw the video I put up on Facebook in my game room, I'm out of room. Having less room on the shelf is a very positive thing. Not just for me, but for a lot of hobby gamers. Um... So an example of this is the Broken Token. That's one of these companies that makes these inserts for Battlestar Galactica. One of my favorite games. That game has three uh, expansions. And the boxes are all that Fantasy Flight, big box. Don't know where my hands are versus the video. Big box, fits good in a Kallax shelf. I don't have Kallax shelves. Well, Battlestar Galactica takes that size box, then the whatever. The three expansions, Exodus, Pegasus, and whatever the last one is. I don't remember now. So that's four boxes for one game. Well, with the broken token insert, every single one of the pieces from all those boxes fits in one box. So now you just save 75% of your space for this game. Like, that's that's awesome. If I want to bring this to, to, to the CG Realm to play on Saturday, I use milk crates to carry my stuff. Well, before, my entire milk crate would be all Battlestar Galactica. Now I can fit Battlestar Galactica in three, four other games. That's that's really cool. So that's, that's a big bonus they, they do. The more important one to me, though, is it quickens setup. So there's less sorting through bits. You're not opening up your box and everything's loose. Now, anyone who does that, I think, is insane. I'm hoping most people at least use plastic baggies or something. But even the plastic baggies, you've got all the different things. you got to open them up. you got to dump them out into containers or out on the table. 99% of inserts that are made nowadays are going to have spots. They're going to have trays that you put all your resources in, or they're going to have like a box for each player. So like all the yellow players pieces go in this box, all the red players pieces go in that box, all the green players pieces go in that box. You're going to have a place for everything, but it's all going to be separated out. So another example is like, if you play a game and you play through three eras, you'll have all the era one tiles in one box or one container and the era two tiles and then another container and the era three tiles. So it, makes it so that starting up just like the for example the rising sun one has all the faction pieces together so you literally grab it and just hand it to someone here you go here's your parts there's no getting stuff out there's no sorting it's all there and ready which is very cool now the third possible positive effect because you may not get all three is usually a result of number two and this is the actual game gets better because of the insert now this is more rare um there are some out there the the best example i own is the Keyflower expansion, or they call it the Keyflower port from Meeple Realty. So this has a tray that looks like a boat. So a little cool thematic thing because there's boats in the game. And the front of it slides out. 
and then you stand a tray on it up so you can see it, and it has all the market tiles. Well, normally in the game, they'd be scattered around the board. They're not kept in one place. Well, this literally stands them up so everyone at the table can see them. The other thing it has is a container where um, stuff goes in the top and comes out the bottom, which is important for that game. You have to pull from the bottom. Well, it gives you a tray to do that. So instead of having a stack of stuff on your table where you have to pick it up and take a piece out, you got this nice wooden tray to pull the pieces out of the bottom. So to me, the best inserts do all three of those. Now, Jaden mentioned quicker put away. That part's iffy. Like in many cases, it's going to be, well, in every case, I think it's going to be way quicker to just grab the box and dump everything in. Like that's going to take seconds. Now, again, you're insane if you do that. And no, don't come to my house, please. Don't touch my games. Um, <laughs> but even if you have baggies, you gotta you, you toss a bunch of things in a baggie is way easier than grabbing the big tray with 18 different places to put stuff and having to sort them into every one. So I got to admit, most trays actually make clean up longer because there's just more sorting to do. But you gain that time back when you're setting up, which to me is way more important because that's your like gameplay time. And then here's your game night planning tip of the night. Let everyone go home, like clean up the game yourself. Like it, don't let that interfere with game time. Even if you're going to play another game, just like shove everything off to the side, put it over there, play your next game. When everyone's gone home, then sort through. Like that gives more time to do the important thing. It goes back to that whole value added, non-value added. When you're having a game night, playing games is value added. Cleaning up games is non-value added. Sorry, project management stuck in my head for 20 years. So yeah, uh, just wait till people go home, clean them up. Inserts may make it worse, but realize that time you're wasting putting stuff away is saved when you set up the game to play next time. So one of the things I want to do more on the show is interact with people online and take their feedback. So this came up on a Twitter conversation because like our last, well, every Ask the Bellhop, I've already covered this once on the blog, so people have seen it, right? People who are would rather read it than hear us talking. Well, there's a guy I follow on Twitter called Ryan Peach. Ryan is blind. He made a really good point. He noted that often inserts and accessories like this make your games more accessible to people with disabilities. It is impossible for Ryan to put parts in the right bag, but he can easily feel an insert with the proper spot to put a part away into the proper place. I think this is a powerful and awesome thing. We all want our game tables to be inclusive and anything that adds to that is fantastic. I was really impressed by that point. It's something as a fully abled person, I don't necessarily consider. So in your list of value added versus non value if you have someone in your game group or you run games in public, this is something else to consider. If you add an insert, it may make the game more accessible to more gamers, which is always a thumbs up. Now, the question is, do you need inserts? As I said earlier, no, never. You you never need one. Like a Terraforming Mars. I I don't know why. Like there's just a bunch of um, two-sided tiles, the big pile of them. There's the resources, which I guess you could split into ones, fives, and tens in separate bags. But like when we play, we just put them all in a pile. They go in a bowl. I have bowls in my house. That's what we use. Uh, yeah, there's 10 special tiles. Sure, throw them in a separate bag. Like there's really not a lot to sort. And like the player pieces, all you have is your board and your cubes. So we put the cubes in baggies. Like having them in a little paper, like wooden tray to me doesn't add a lot. Now I will note, you may want to buy a Terraforming Mars insert for a... Um, player board overlay that may justify the cost to you but i'll let you know shop around because you can get just overlays cheaper so i don't own an insert for terraforming mars i don't see the need but i do own overlays for the player boards but that's not really what we're talking about actually Jaden asked another question we may get to at some point about other neat game things that aren't inserts that's where that falls uh, azul why like what do, I, what do i want an organizer for that it comes with a perfectly fine tray like most games you, you don't need it like i said earlier you need to figure out what value it'll add so if the game takes a real long time to set up you might want to consider some type of insert if a game takes up a lot of space and you have a lot of expansions you might want to consider a way to organize the parts if the game actually improves gameplay now there's a pretty good reason to do it another example of 
I, I guess it, it improves gameplay slightly. It makes things less fiddly. So the Castles of Mad King Ludwig insert, this one also is from Broken Token. The way the trays are set up is they perfectly match where you're supposed to stack the tiles on the board. So instead of stacking the tiles on the board, you can literally just take the component things and put them out. And like, not only does that hold everything nicer, you don't have a problem where people are knocking over piles, which sounds silly, but it happens all the time. Oh, someone knocked over that pile. I got to restack it. So to me, that actually made gameplay better. I can't knock over the piles, which messes up the order of things. They're always held nice in wooden trays. So to me, that ups the, the value. And as I mentioned before, if you're out of room, if you can get a game thing that'll reduce space by 75% and let you fit three more games on yourself, to me, that's worth it. And on top of now, that, Grubnats in the in the chat room mentioned minis. You know, you need yes. to have the right way to hold your minis, painted or not. But especially with painted, you don't want to show up and be, and have all your hard work smudged or damaged in transport. Very true. Very true. I used to be a painter. I I can't claim I am now. The last miniature I painted was Bones Series One. Showed up. I painted one halfling out of two vampire boxes of minis. Uh, so I, I don't consider myself a miniature painter anymore. But still, even then, like the miniatures, like those Shade Spire miniatures, you wouldn't toss those in the box. They're going to break. Rising Sun, you might get away with tossing those in baggies. Trust me, I've thought about it because the insert for Rising Sun that I want is $300. As I said, you have to weigh it. Right now, it's on the bad side. Now, one of the things to note is you don't have to go all fancy with these birch wood expensive inserts. I can't remember who it is, but oh, I do. Matta. Matta is your last name. Chris Matta. I have to thank you for correcting me in the blog post. I originally put balsa wood. They are not balsa wood. They are birch wood. But you don't have to buy the fancy wood stuff. Plano boxes. Like people have been using Plano for years. People go to a store in the States called the Container Store just to buy plastic containers to put their stuff in. Like this is the stuff. Where I find you can get them here locally is Canadian Tire. And where you go is the fishing lure department. Or you go to where they have loose nuts and bolts. I Like some uh, fishing lure boxes, fishing boxes, they sometimes call them, plano boxes, any of those plastic sorters, they're dirt cheap. Like they even sell them at the dollar store here. You go to Dollarama and you can get some. And I think that's the ones I used for um, Commanded Colors Ancients. So you don't have to go full on big wooden hours to assemble it. You can just get something to hold it. What's really neat is Board Game Geek actually has a geek list where it's what plano box you need for this game, which is really cool. I link that over on the blog if you head over there. And we mentioned them earlier. There's nothing really wrong with the humble baggy. Like, I even bought color-coded ones, which my wife still swears is a waste of money. So when she did her value-add thing, she got a different answer than me. But, like, I put all the yellow pieces in the yellow bag and all the red pieces in the red bag, and now it's sorted better than before. You know where everything goes. I, I personally really like those. And... One thing people should think of, especially if you're not a parent and you don't make a lot of lunches for kids, there are a lot more different size baggies than you might yes. think of. It's yes. amazing how broad the Ziploc category has become in the grocery <laughs> store. Um, and I appreciate that as a parent, but as a gamer, you almost appreciate it even more. Uh, they're not yeah. just for carrots and sandwiches anymore. Therefore, you're gaming too. And so make sure you, you think about making having the right bags for the right games and for the right game pieces. You don't want to just throw a couple of cards into a giant baggie when you can get a, a smaller one. And really, I mean, how, how expensive is it to buy a bag of zip, a yeah. box of Ziplocs? So There's actually companies out there now that make board game baggies. So... I'm sure they're probably not worth it. I buy my bags at the dollar store, but yeah. well, except for those color ones that kickstarted, those cost a little more. So Jared Hader had a good tip. I've never met a gamer who labels his baggies, yet all of them expect other people to know which bits go into which bag. Teardown would be much faster if things were labeled so that all the players at the table could work on their own and put everything away for you or with you. You know, that's not a bad point. I've never labeled mine. I guess it's kind of the same effect as the colored baggies. But then my wife's argument comes in is if they're all the same size bag, what's it matter what goes in which? I don't know. It's a good point. Maybe it's something we should start doing. So, so where can you get them? 
Where do we where do we pick up our uh, inserts? Okay, over on the blog, I actually put links in the show notes. There should be links later. But there's a ton of places to do this. The the big three expensive companies. Uh, no, that sounded bad. They're not expensive companies, but they make the higher end inserts. We'll put it that way. Some are more expensive than others. Is Broken Token. I find Broken Token is really good for functional inserts. Like they are the ones that will get the most in that box. So the you won't need expansion boxes ever again, and they'll leave room for an expansion you didn't even know was coming yet. Then there's Meeple Realty. Meeple Realty makes very similar products but i find meeple realty is uh more on the gameplay so they put in the funky stuff that may improve gameplay they do a lot of really intricate woodwork where you have like drawers that open and close and lids for everything so it doesn't spill but i find they don't quite I don't, they, they spend more time on fluff right like i mentioned in um key flower the thing that holds the tiles looks like a boat now because of that it was a pita to uh assemble it was not fun Broken token ones, I haven't even had to use glue on any of mine. But then the Meeple Realty ones add more functionality sometimes. So it's the two of them. I personally, like I went to Origins and I wanted an insert for Gloomhaven. And we went to both and went, uh, let's see your insert. Okay, let's see your insert. And between the two, I made my pick. And I think you have to do that. So once you've done your value added, you also have to shop around. Another one that's fairly new is Game Trays. I love their stuff. They make just your, your foam, foam, foam's the wrong word, form, plastic mold, forgetting the word, form molded, whatever you call that, plastic trays. They make plastic trays for games. They made a fantastic insert for Star Wars Rebellion. Not only does it have a spot for every card, every uh, character counter, every miniature, they're divided up by faction. So you literally go, here, Rebel player, you get these two trays. Here, Imperial player, you get these two trays. Play. Like, there is, like, I guess you have to sort sort the card. You shuffle the cards. That's about all you have to do to set up that game now. It's it's crazy. They also do some really nice um, card holders and stuff that you can use in any of your games. Then there's Zen Bins. Zen Bins also do Plastic. There's Daedalus Productions, which is fairly new. They do wood. There's Insert Here. Uh, there's Go7 Gaming. Like, there are a ton of these. If you Google custom inserts nowadays, you're going to find a ton of companies. Now, Yanni Cooper, a friend I have on G+, he noticed after I originally wrote about the topic about a fantastic company called Folded Space. I didn't even know these guys existed. What they do is the foam core inserts. Foam core inserts, most people do it themselves. They make them. You go to whatever, Walmart, and you buy foam core, and you cut it out, and a lot of people put out patterns. Well, these are more similar to the Meeple Realty uh, Broken Token, where they're pre-cut, and they're pre-made, and they're all set, good to go. So you order them, they show up at your house, and you just put it together, maybe use some glue, and you're good to go. These cost, like, less than half what the wooden ones do. Now, one of the disadvantages to wooden tokens or wooden tokens, wooden inserts I didn't mention before is they can be heavy. Like I own Caverna and it's a heavy game. Like if you drop that on your toes, you're probably breaking something. Well, throw a wood insert in there too. Now it's like one third more heavy than it used to be. It's crazy. Uh, or Suburbia. That game is ridiculously heavy with the insert. Well, the folded space does the same thing functionally, but weighs like nothing, right? It's, it's foam core. It's nothing. So I got to check them out. I personally haven't bought anything by Folded Space to try it out, but it's definitely something I'll be looking for. We also got a comment on Facebook that noted 3D printing inserts is awesome. I wouldn't pay anyone to make an insert for something I had to glue together, but a sturdy plastic insert I can print out on demand is a godsend to board gaming. And you know what? A 3D printing is the next the next generation, the yeah. next step. It is. That, that's, that's one step up. It's definitely a cool idea. It's not something I considered. I thought about printing your own minis and printing your own scenery, but yeah, printing your own insert, that's brilliant. Like if you've got the pre 3D printer for it. And some places you can actually now even get a hold of 3D printing in uh, public libraries. So yeah, it's, becoming, we've got that here. it's becoming a much more uh, accessible technology. So it's definitely something to look into. And there's a lot of free projects and models available out there on the internet. Yeah. So then you got the last option. I kind of mentioned this a bit when I mentioned phone core is do it yourself. Like people have been doing this for years. Like 
Broken Token and Meeple Realty or whoever, I don't know who was first, was like, well, you know, people are doing this themselves. We could do it for them and sell it to them. Well, you can still do it yourself. Uh, sure, if you got your own laser cutter, you can do the wood thing, but like cardboard, uh, like I said, balsa wood, um, foam core. Uh, if you go online and you go foam core insert pattern, insert game name here, you'll find multiple in instances. Another really simple one is if your printer can handle card, thick card, doing tuck boxes for any card games. People have been doing it for years. You can find patterns online, and it's not free, but compared to the cost of one of those inserts, it's pretty cheap. And again, back to those boxes, the plastic boxes, there's also, you can get boxes with pluck and pull foam inside, so you can custom separate foam areas yourself if you really want to. Yeah, there's one company, Battle Foam, I think it is, that like specializes in that, where they got them pre-cut, so like you can get the X-Wing one, and it'll have like a cutout for the Millennium Falcon that fits perfectly in it, which is pretty cool. That's one I hadn't thought of. So now that we know all about, uh, what about building these and putting these together? They, you know, these these aren't coming pre-made in most cases. <laughs> no, they're not. Uh, amusing side story. I don't know the name of the person, but there was someone on my G plus feed that would like when this, this thing first came out a couple years ago, that was like, I will pay you to No, It was on the secret cabal podcast. That's where it was where they were offering to pay $40 to have an insert shipped to someone, have them assemble it and ship it back to them. Cause you know, it's, it's, it's not necessarily fun. Well, they, you can hire Most people to build Ikea furniture now. So why not build your yeah, inserts? There you go. And Ikea furniture and inserts, there, there's some similarity there. So the main thing is RTFM. I'm not going to say what that means out loud because we are not meant to be explicit. We're Read that fancy show, manual. Yes, read that fancy manual. Good one. Do it. Like, like read it. Don't guess. Don't look at this pile of wood and go, oh, obviously this goes here and this goes here. Like, like don't just assume you can build this thing. Like, like read, read the book, right? Like, read the instructions. Possibly go online and look for clarification. That, once you've started, don't read it once and put the book away. Like, go back to it. Read it a second time. Because just because box A and box B for player one and two are built the same, maybe the one for player three is different for some reason. Trust me, I made this mistake on the Core Worlds box set. A rubber mallet. I should have brought my tools up here for the people watching at home. There's a reason I haven't. I'll get to that in a minute. You want a rubber mallet because it is thin. Birchwood is not very strong. You don't want to use a hammer. Hammer will damage wood. Rubber mallet should not. Don't go too crazy with the rubber mallet. Scotch tape is your friend. I should, probably shouldn't use a brand name. I don't even know. What do you call scotch tape if it's not scotch tape? I Clear think, I think tape? it's become generic. I think we're actually allowed to use that. I, I think scotch right. tape is genericized the scotch people aren't going to sue us for talking about the tape on the podcast so yeah scotch whatever you call it packing tape no not packing, not tape, packing tape. <laughs> clear invisible tape the stuff you get everywhere this stuff it's your friend every corner use it tape it down you don't have to take it off like like not just tape it to hold it but all you gotta do is re reinforce the four corners every square thing i have made out of an insert scotch tape is enough to hold it together like taking it out of the box, putting it back in. If you're more worried than I am about stuff like this, use glue. Like it's not going to hurt anything. I'm just impatient. I don't want to wait for the glue to dry because then it goes from taking an hour to two hours to build an insert to taking multiple days because you got to glue stuff, let it dry overnight, do the next part, let it dry overnight. I suggest using glue with scotch tape. Then maybe at the end, if you really don't like the look of tape on your stuff, you take it off. Uh, a couple things I missed when I wrote the first blog post. Use an, again, I'm using a brand name here, but use a hobby knife for cutting the wood out. Use an X-Acto. Uh, you want something sharp, cut away from yourself, and you got to catch the corners, right? So you don't, uh, just, just so normally you can just twist it and the stuff pops out. Using a knife will give you a cleaner break. And every now and then, the way the wood's made when it cuts, it leaves a little bit. The other thing is sandpaper. You want to use, it can be even fairly heavy grit, but... Just like when you're taking miniatures off a sprue, you're going to get little nubs throw in there. It makes it a little harder to get things to fit. Use the sandpaper to get rid of that. I'll admit I'm lazy. I don't always do that. So what I do use it for, though, is a tight fit. If two pieces won't fit good together, use some sandpaper. It's all wood. It's easy to work with. So to summarize everything, 
you don't need these. They're not gonna. Your game works without them. Like you don't even need the baggies. You can just sweep everything in the box. Probably not the best idea, but it's your choice. Now you might want them. So you do a value assessment. Like, do I? Does the cost justify it? Often baggies or a plano box will do, or some foam core. The one thing that to me is important is the game on your shelf's worth nothing. I think I'm probably going to say this every episode. The game that is the best is the one you're actually getting to play. So if you look at the game on your shelf, like, oh man, I really want to play Suburbia, but I got three expansions in that box and all the tiles are mixed up and I'm going to have to go through it. Nah, forget it. Let's play something else. Suburbia is now worthless to you. You bought it. You spent money. It's not getting played. Now, if you put an insert in there and it means you're going to now play Suburbia, that insert's now worth it. It's the game getting played is better than the game sitting there gathering dust. And if an insert will stop the game from gathering dust, to me, it's worth it. That's that's where the, the t- pendulum swings for me. Well, we've given a lot of coverage here. But if you're looking for something to read, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com, where the tabletop where the bellhop has covered this topic in blog form. Remember, if you've got a burning question, you can head over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. All one word. Support us at the good tip or better level, and your questions get bumped to the top of the list. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers, Brian Kurtz, although you've just uh, left... You'll hear this on the podcast. <laughs> Good timing. Thank you. Our latest patron, Duran Barnett. Thank you very much for tipping the bellhop. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com and drop by tabletopbellhop.com where you can also find regular posts including detailed answers to questions, game reviews, the weekend review, and more. I'm also working on building some master lists, some curated lists of all the gaming podcasts, Twitch channels, um, and Patreons out there. I actually was doing a lot of work on that today. So if you stop by the web page and you mouse over tabletop Patreon, you'll now see you can break it out by board games or role playing. That's something I'm hoping to finish off at the, this weekend. So it's a great resource if you're looking for other patrons to support, if you're looking to podcast to listen to, or I've just added a section for Twitch channels to watch like this one. If you like the content we're providing and you'd like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. We are still tweaking the Patreon. Every level that's there now is not going to change. We're very unlikely to change. I think we're keeping everything where it is. We are looking at potentially adding more reward tiers as a thing goes on. We are open to input, though, especially you guys in the chat room. If you've seen our Patreon and you think there's something we can offer, I would love to know. We're having a not a hard time. Like I think what we've got out there for rewards is good, but it would be great to know what you guys want as opposed to us just guessing. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Thursday night at 9:30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Live and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live podcast to hit your podcatchers at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean and I'm Mo. Thank you and game on.